upper respiratory tract. Okay, so on this page we'll look at the anatomy of a sagittal view of the head. Um, to kind of help you get your bearings, let's look at where um, air comes in here. So these are the nasal passages. And they are lined with a mucous membrane. And then this is um, the mouth cavity or the oral cavity. And then we could use a purple pen to outline. So this is the where the air is going. Kind of. And then this is the mouth. This region right here is actually the muscular tongue. Okay, so hopefully you have your bearings now. So air would come in the nose, food comes in the mouth, and then this back area right here is called the pharynx where both air and food can be mixing. So let's first look at the sinuses. There's frontal sinus. So this is a cavity within the frontal bone that helps to lighten the skull. And then here is what's called the ethmoid sinus, or at least one view of it. And these are cavities within the ethmoid bone. And then I'll use pink over here for the sphenoid sinuses. And these are gaps within the sphenoid bone. And all sinuses help to uh, lighten the skull and they're lined with mucous membrane. And so if they're inflamed, then there can be sinus pressure and causing caused in the very typical places. You can have it in your forehead or um, kind of, it almost feels like behind your eyes, back by the sphenoid ones. Um, with the bridge of your nose, the ethmoid sinuses, and then if it's right under your eyes, that's your maxillary sinuses, which you can't see on this view. Bacteria can also get into the sinuses um, because your nose, your, your eye, your tears drain down to your nasal passages, and then those are connected with the sinuses as well. So it can be an area where um, you can get a bacterial or viral infection. But you have lots of tonsils, to fight off pathogens that get into the respiratory tract. These contain concentrate a high concentration, so it contain a high concentration of white blood cells to fight infection. Let me show you a few of those. So the highest that you have are called your adenoids. And the adenoid tonsils, so adenoid tonsils, these are the ones that are implicated in snoring and sleep apnea because if they get really swollen and inflamed they actually can get so big they block airflow through the nose. So if they're very enlarged 
they can cause snoring and or sleep apnea. Usually the two things go together. And this is one of the major reasons why little kids have to have their adenoids out. Sometimes kids that have uh, sleep apnea because of enlarged adenoids can develop symptoms of attention deficit or some more irritable behaviors because really they're sleep deprived. It can also be at the um, uh, associated with weight gain. So if they're enlarged, that's associated with weight gain too. Okay, then there's another uh, pair of tonsils. The back of your throat. These are the ones that you can see. Um, these are the, if you look in the mirror, the very back on either side of the back of your throat. These are the palatine tonsils. You hear that name palate because if you look in your mouth and you can see those at the back and they're, this is your palate, right? And so they're called the palatine tonsils because they're closest to the palatine uh, part of the mouth. And then um, there are also lingual tonsils. And the lingual tonsils are, um, as you can see, kind of tucked down on either side at the back of the tongue. So the palatine tonsils are ones that are commonly removed in kids if they get very enlarged um, from repeated um, strep throat, for example. This can be a haven for um, streptococcus pyogenes. So S. pyogenes, a bacteria that causes strep throat, can live here. Uh, in some people, it is there. Sometimes it's not. So I should say sometimes. So it sometimes col colonizes the palatine tonsils. It could colonize any of them, but this seems to be the magnet for them. Okay, so next um, I want to look at uh, the eustachian tube. I've just drawn a, a hole here at the back of the... Um, the back of the nasal passages that goes up to, let's see, where can we put this? You have one of these that connects to each ear from the back of your throat. And so you can see that um, pathogens can enter and you might remember from 241 that the purpose is to equalize pressure between the middle ear and the outside of the body but because of this opening now pathogens can enter um, and be able to go up to the middle ear Okay, the next thing I want to look at are um, two structures that help to keep you from choking when you're um, eating. So the upper structure has a funny name called the uvula, and you can see that when you open your mouth and look in the mirror. It's that floppy thing that hangs down at the very back of your throat in the middle, and you only have one of these. And when you swallow, when you're eating, the uvula actually goes upward, and so it helps to keep food from going into your nasal passages while you're eating. Of course, you've all seen people that are able to um, have milk come out their nose or things like that, or if that happens on accident when they're eating and milk comes out their nose, what it means is they were probably trying to take a big inhale at the same time they were eating, and the uvula did not go upward as it should and then um, food that was in the pharynx or milk was able to go back up and out the nose. So 
So uvula blocks food from entering the nasal passages. And then there is the very important epiglottis. I'll put that in orange too because these are both the important structures that help to prevent choking and food going the wrong way. This is the epiglottis. You might remember from 241 that this is made of elastic cartilage. And when you swallow, the epiglottis covers up the opening to the trachea, which is right here. Okay, so we have the epiglottis and the uvula. So next, um, you can see the esophagus back here. Could, um, maybe go ahead and outline that in purple, the continued opening right here for food. This is the esophagus. It's a muscular tube. And notice it's at the back, and then the tube opening in the front is the trachea. Also known as the windpipe. And it's protected by hyaline cartilage. From the side view, it might look kind of like this. And you've got the Adam's apple is a particularly big piece. But it, it kind of protects around the front like this. And the tracheal cartilage is... They're made of hyaline. And they protect the trachea and they also hold it open. And then this special one right here that forms the Adam's apple is called the thyroid cartilage because it's right near the thyroid gland. And that's what we call the Adam's apple. And you can use, what color have we not used? Very much red, orange, yellow, green, blue. I've used all the colors, haven't I? Let's go back to yellow for, oh no, that won't be good. I'm going to actually use black right here. Kind of give you an idea of what the vocal cords look like. I'm going to put an asterisk and then come down here and I can tell you about those. So the vocal cords. These elongate during puberty. And that's what causes a lower voice. So you can see here these are the vocal cords, and as they elongate the Adam's apple, the cartilage is growing too. And so men, of course, tend to have a lower voice and tend to have a more prominent thyroid uh, cartilage, and their vocal cords are longer and uh, thicker, so they thicken. So if you think of, like, the strings on a guitar, the thickest strings cause the lowest tone, and it's the same way uh, with our vocal cords. Is that, and the way that we speak is as the air rushes past the vocal cords, they um, tighten and relax to make different pitches. It's pretty amazing, really. We have our voice as an instrument, a stringed instrument. And then uh, laryngitis, that's inflammation of the larynx.
And this um, can happen either if a lot of mucus gets caught on the vocal cords or um, if they are just inflamed themselves and it can make it so that they're not able to tighten and relax as needed and so you can't make the sounds um, that you need to make for speech or to be heard.